All right. I'm going to put up the cahoots. It is 70 questions. If you have to run for any reason, I understand it. You don't have to tell me, okay? Um, but it, it will be recorded. So do as much as you can. Now, I did do it in St. Patty's Day. So happy St. Patty's Day, everybody. Might as well get into the season, right? St. Yeah. Patty's Day already. Anybody want a green beer? <laughs> I think it's St. Patty's Day. That's what I think of. And that dye usually makes me violently ill. So I can't have green beer. So again, remember these questions. I'm going to turn them around a little bit. Um, ask them, you know, backwards, front ways, or just give you a diagnosis. See if you can pick those things out about it. And then, of course, on Thursday evening, I will be doing the 100 question cahoots, too. So you'll have 170 questions of all the things you need to know. That's not too bad for an entire semester. Uh, we got to get going, so we'll be out by oh, about 10 after, I would say, unless I can talk really quick. But it's my second class today, so we'll see. What is probably the single most important influence on growth at all stages of development? You've heard me say this 100 times, <clears throat> at least 100 times. Whenever I say it, I say nutrition, 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 nutrition. If you don't have enough nutrition, it's going to affect cognitive development, growth development, so nutrition. Frequent developmental assessments are important for which reason? I can say they're really the, the most important is so we can have early intervention. So we have those normal periods and then all of a sudden we're not moving anywhere. There's something wrong. We need to intervene with it. Or if we see um, that they're not up to level, if their head lag, their head is falling back when you pick them up at seven, eight months old, there's a problem. They should hold their head by two to three months old. So we can have early intervention and help these children. The head to tail direction of growth is called, referred to, head to tail. It's called cephalocaudal. It's just a word to remember. You'll see it referred that way a lot. What is the single most important factor to consider when communicating with children? I mean, it doesn't matter if they're an adolescent, doesn't matter if they're an infant or a toddler. I mean, if you can't communicate with a child and express what you need to do, especially the younger kids are gonna be running in the opposite direction. So go on their level, let them understand that you are not going to do bad things, that this is what you need to do on their level. And of course, touching and feeling those uh, pieces of equipment is very important also. What two-year-old child pain assessment tool should the nurse use? Now we know there's many, there's faces, numeric, outer, flack, but two-year-old. So, it is flack and most students say faces. That's why this question is here. Faces does not start to preschool, three years old, okay? Flack is that up till um, right before they turn three. So this is you know, giving you that hint because you will see these things. Can you explain again real quick what that is? I'm trying to think. Sure, hold on. Priority treatment for a child with dehydration due to profuse vomiting. So when you have vomiting, you don't want anything in the mouth 
immediately. It doesn't mean NPO. It just means we want to rest the abdomen, the stomach. We want to give them some medicine to stop the vomiting, but IV fluids, because then we know we are going to get that in there and they'll be able to keep it in. Now, you were talking about those um, type of school um, pain uh, scales. You know, in America, we know from zero to 10. FLAC, let me, let me tell you all of the numbers. It is for nonverbal children and it goes on their face, their legs, their activity, their cry and consolability. So they don't have to tell you they hurt. You can see the grimacing. You can see their legs flailing. You can see them maybe just hunched in a position that you can know. And if they're crying, and the big thing with children is consolability. If you can't console them, something's wrong. Adults, you can, you know, go forever and, on, you know, you can't console them. But children, if they can be consoled, you can pick them up, hug them and give them a hot pack, rub their tummy, whatever, and they'll feel better if they have the ability. If they can't, you know, there's something. You need to listen to what that kid's saying. The first expected fine motor developmental milestone for an infant begins with what? Remember, fine fingers, gross, get up and go, go, go. I've been watching too much Paw Patrol. Fingers, first thing is the reflex. Put something in their hand and they'll close it. It's just a reflex. Many mommy goes, look, the baby's squeezing my hand, giving me a hug. You know, it is a reflex. I won't tell them that because it's sweet. But first reflex, and then it's a voluntary. They go out and reach it. They want it. That's the second step. An eight-month-old infant should expect to perform which fine motor skills? Eight-month-old, what should they be able to do? Remember, fine, we're talking fingers, stuff they can do. And we know up to a year old, at that year old, they should be able to build a block of two blocks. That's the last one in the first year. So in that middle age, about eight months old, they should be able to grasp that rattle when they want and then go to those Cheerios or those little puff things on their high chair and be able to get them. But instead of one little finger, and the thumb, it's maybe a couple fingers and they sort of smush it. And it's the beginning of the fine motors and that's an eight month old. In general, an infant should triple their birth weight at blank months of age. So we know double at six months, we triple at one year old. An RN is assessing a two and a half year old toddler should report which finding to the provider. When you're reporting something, something's not right. <clears throat> so when their head is still too big, there's a problem. Now, a newborn infant has big heads. That's what we expect. But as they grow and about two years old, they should be equaled or the chest should be a little more. If not, what's going on? Is there hydrocephalus? Is there a tumor? What's happening? It's just not normal. So it just needs to be investigated. A two month old infant has cradle cap. What should the nurse tell the parents to do to treat it? So you have absolutely should wash the child's hair. Um, sometimes it's, you know, putting mineral oil there, maybe a soft comb, but just very gently, softly brushing the hair. And that should get rid of a lot of that um, debris that you see. According to Kohlberg's pre-conventional level of moral development, a preschooler who has moral reasoning understands what? What's Kohlberg all about? 
We know Freud is all about sucking and chewing and biting, all that oral stuff is the first level um, with the infants. But Kohlberg talks about there's right and there's wrong behaviors. Good, good behaviors or right behaviors have a good consequence, but bad has a bad consequence. So this is Kohlberg, what he's talking about. Good and bad and both have a consequence to them. Which nursing action is appropriate to teach a preschool age child about a scheduled procedure? So again, when you have children, procedures, let them touch and feel the equipment, use a doll, let them explain it. You know, child life is an amazing addition to pediatrics and use them. Um, they really can help a child um, be less stressful, uh, understand what's gonna happen to them. Before performing a physical assessment on a toddler, the nurse should do what to cooperate, to encourage cooperation? Again, let them touch, feel, play with this stuff. Absolutely. These are important things and you can do it quickly and it saves you a lot of time. In terms of language and cognitive development, a four-year-old child should be expected to do what? You know, this is Piaget, cognitive development. What should they be able to do? They should be able to follow simple commands. I mean, my grandson is five. I just walked out and the toys are everywhere because he's been homesick with me. And I said, please, could you pick it up and make me happy? And he went around, picked it all up. And he says, I'm picking up the toys because you want me to, and I want you happy. <laughs> Parents are concerned. Her eight month old child is not developing like her older child. What is normal for eight months? And again, remember, two children are never the same. Each child is going to go through their own levels in their own pace. As long as they're moving forward, they're good. But an eight-month-old should be able to sit unsupported. Now, pulling themselves up to that sitting position is what happens right before they can sit there unsupported. They're on their knees, and then they sit down on their butts, and they're sitting there but they still maybe need help. They might still fall over but by eight months. Absolutely sitting by themselves, unsupported. A multi-select. Which would alert the nurse to hold the digoxin on an infant she's caring for? I mean, we've been taught what are the signs and symptoms of digoxin on an adult, but an infant can't tell you how they're feeling. So you have to understand those things that you should monitor about DIG and DIG toxicity. So the one thing is the heart rate. The second is monitoring that uh, digoxin level. 3.3 um, is very high. The potassium level is normal, which we want it normal, so that's good. And the infant is vomiting. They can't tell you about yellow spots or halo and stuff. But even if a kid, an infant, is just vomiting on digoxin, I will hold the dose, tell the doctor, and get a dig level. I would rather be safe um, and hold a dose than give a dose and uh, promote more dig toxicity. A four-year-old is reluct reluctant to take medicines. What intervention should the nurse take? Four-year-olds are hard to give medicines to, many of them. So you're basically just going to do a straightforward approach. Walk in there. Don't let them make excuses. Don't let anybody else do it for you. Say, I have medicine to give you. Do you want to take, you want a pill to chew or would you like liquid? Would you like the liquid in a cup? Would you like it in a syringe? Those are your choices. What do you want? So it's straightforward. And usually because they can make a decision, um, you will have this four-year-old taking their medicines better than normal and it's hard.
which concept reinforces the development of trust for an infant? I already told you that you're going to see uh, a lot of questions. There was four on uh, the HESI last semester regarding Erickson, Kohlberg, and Piaget. So reviewing this would be a good thing. Now, infants, how do they know trust? When do they feel happy? They are happy when they can predict what's coming. I cry, somebody's going to get me. If I'm hungry, they're going to feed me. If I'm wet, they're going to change me. If I need to burp, I'm going to burp. And this is the trust. When you see an infant that doesn't cry and they're wet or hungry, it means that they're tired of crying. That means they're not getting their needs met. And that's one of the ways you can tell abuse in an infant by the way they respond. An infant is NPO, unable to take breasts or bottles for feedings. What's important to remember? For normal growth and development, what should we remember? Always remember the pacifier because it's how a child soothes themselves. It's a stress reliever. Like Freud says that sucking, chewing, biting is all part of what helps giving them self-soothing. So pacifiers, non-nutritive sucking is very important. When teaching sex education and contraceptive for adolescents, what should the nurse consider? Now, many times this is when the parents have stepped outside and you're asking some personal questions. You might get a question from the adolescent regarding you know, sex education and contraceptive. How do you give it in the best way? And tell them just basically what they wanna know the question. Don't put your biases in there. And if you have some written information, brochures, pamphlets, something, please give it to them because then they can read it at their own leisure. The monthly immunization for respiratory cynical virus is, we give this um, immunization for those children who are immunosuppressed, uh, could be cardiac, could be a uh, premature child, and to prevent all that extra mucus. And it's called Synergist or Palvizumab, and it's monthly from fall to early spring. And it does stop them from getting all that viral illness with those extra secretions. It's too much on them. A three-year-old is brought into the ER with increasing wheezing for the last two days. She's using an MD, um, her MDI. What's the most important information you need to know? So that MDI, is she using it? Is there a spacer? Because if you're not doing it properly, of course your wheezing is getting worse because no medicine's going in. Good job. An infant with hypoplastic left heart is becoming tachypnic, taking a long time to eat and requires rest. What assessment is priority? You have a cardiac child making changes. What are you gonna suspect here? So the first thing you're going to expect to, to listen to is the lungs, because this sounds like tachypnea. This is lungs. Something's going on. These children do have the um, possibility of becoming congestive and congestive heart failure. So we're going to listen to the lungs. They might need a dose of furosemide or an extra dose of furosemide. So these are classic signs of congestive failure. When doing an admission on an infant with a low grade fever and a loose cough, what information is priority for placement? There's something that we don't think as nurses and nursing students, you, know, you get a call from admissions, you have a child who needs a room, you need to put them in the proper room with another child, being safe for this child and the other one. So what are the immunizations? Are they up to date? 
Is it something that the other child could catch from them? Uh, so that is the most important. Now, of course, medications and fevers are important, but it has nothing to do with placement. Placement, we want to know, are we keeping the other child safe? Is it just the normal upper respiratory type things? A multi-select. What is included in the plan of care for a child with cystic fibrosis? So cystic fibrosis is all about the lungs and nutritionally, they're not getting all that they do need. So high protein diet is going to help with the muscle wasting on these children. Of course, aggressive, aggressive chest physical therapy because the lungs clog up with mucus and it's thick. I describe it like a Petri dish. If you don't keep it up and moving, it's going to grow bacteria. And then of course, the pancreatic enzyme should be given right before the meals to help digest and be able to utilize the nutrition that you've eaten. Remember low sodium, these children take a sweat test. They have sweat pouring out of their pores do, uh, with, with salt. Do we need to decrease the sodium? No, they need sodium in their diet because they are losing it. Which in information is the most important? when rheumatic fever is suspected. And that has to do with a sore throat. Rheumatic fever and glomerular nephritis, both are the two things that I've described to you that could be caused from a strep pharyngitis. And we treat both of them by giving them the antibiotics to help cure the infection a multi-select. What are some assessments that an infant would have if they were in acute respiratory distress? Now infants described as up to 12 months old. And I've explained to you, if I have a child who's nasal flaring and I hear a grunt I'm going right to the trauma room. This is an extremely ill child who could, you know, the respiratory could collapse at any moment. Now, it's not diaphragmatic respirations, it's more abdominal uh, respirations. And respiratory rate of 34 is actually low. Um, you, you're saying acute respiratory distress, it should be uh, above 40 to 60 breaths per minute. What is the purpose of giving indomethacin to a neonate with a PDA? Remember the PDA connects the aorta to the pulmonary artery and it allows oxygenation in some cardiac conditions that there is no other way to get oxygenated. Sometimes we don't need it though, so we close it. Now, this PDA, the whole thing about it is you need to know that prostaglandin keeps it open. You don't have prostaglandins after the baby's born and it will close unless we give a synthetic prostaglandin. And that would be like for your transposition. Now, if we have it open and don't need it, indomethacin says, hey, I don't need prostaglandins anymore, stop. And it will stop producing it and then we will have those ducts close. Sometimes you have to do surgical uh, closure, but most of the time it could just be medication, the endomethacin. What is the great, greatest risk factor for a newborn receiving a cardiac catheterization? What do I always tell you to check first? Because of the size of the vessels we're working with here. And it's all about hemorrhage. They can hemorrhage their whole blood in a couple minutes. So always checking that first, that pressure dressing, is it correct? Is it not bleeding, oozing? A 10 month old status post to VSD repairs, getting morning meds, the vital signs. What med should the nurse question? Blood pressure 118 over 70, temp 99, pulse 88, respiratory rate 
22. You know, in this case, there's only one thing this infant is showing you, and that's a decreased heart rate. And that is below the parameters. They say below 100. I'll uh, hold it, call the physician and monitor for digitoxicity. While assessing a newborn infant, you notice decreased femoral pulses bilaterally. What action should be next? You just got the child right out of the delivery room and you're assessing this child and you notice those femoral pulses are really weak and they're almost non-existent. What could you do next to say, I think I know what that diagnosis is and this will prove it. And that's monitoring for extremity BPs. This looks like a coarctation of the aorta. So your lower blood pressures, because there's hardly any blood flow getting down there, your blood pressure will be decreased because it's all going to the upper areas, the arms and head, we're going to have higher blood pressures in the upper extremities. And that will say your coarctation of the aorta. I actually did that once and diagnosed it. I still remember it. it was one of my first cardiac kids. How do you get an adolescent to open up about their sexual history? So just start talking to them about what's going on in their life, their social life. What music do they like? You know, do they play sports, et cetera, et cetera. And you start um, talking to them about things they like, they will open up and they'll tell you more. Adolescents are hard to get to. A multi-select. When educating adolescents about risks for HIV hepatitis, what would you include? So anything HIV, hepatitis, you know, we, we want them to be abstinent, but they're going to do what they want. So at least condoms during sex and, of course, always hand washing. Weekly showers, I think we do more than just weekly showers. What stage of Erickson's would you use for a school-age child? Remember, school-age children love to do things well. They like to be the best at math, the best at maybe a sport, but when they're not, they become very frustrated. So we have the industry is what they do well and inferiority is, I just can't do that well and I wanna do it better. So remember, you will see them on your ASCII, a multi-select. A child with hemophilia has fallen and the knee is swollen and painful. Treatment would include what? So we're going to rice it. We're going to rest it, ice it. Um, put it in an ACE bandage, and we are going to put cold packs on it, um, and this is going to help decrease it, just like a swollen uh, uh, sprained ankle, same sort of thing, and this is going to keep it from bleeding um, more than it should, and probably give some home um, factor therapy. Your child with ALL has recent lab results with the platelet count of 10,000, your nursing action at this point is what? What is that telling you? And it doesn't matter if it's ALL or anything. Platelet counts of 10,000 is absolutely a bleeding problem. So no IM injections, you know, watch for breathing, um, protect from injury, et cetera, et cetera. Child starts with a nosebleed for no reason. What action should you do first? <clears throat> if 
First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pinch it and we're gonna hold it there for 10 minutes and then we'll release it and see if it stopped. If not, they're gonna go and seek care. Tilt the head back, they're gonna swallow it. Now ice is good, but while you're pinching it was good. An eight-year-old semi-conscious boy is brought to the ER, elevated blood sugar, potassium, low pH, priority action. What do you need to do first? What does that sound like? Blood sugar, greater. That's DKA. You even are showing acidosis with that low pH. So we're going to give a bolus of normal saline, and then we're going to be giving regular insulin IV in increments to get that blood sugar down. Of course, we'll be monitoring potassium and all of that, of course, but our priority goal, IV fluids and to give some insulin, get the sugar down. It's crazy. You can watch these children come in pale and semi-conscious, give them fluid, a little bit of insulin, and they get pink and they're wide awake. Child is admitted with hypoparathyroidism. What findings would you see that needs to be reported to the healthcare provider? Well, parathyroid works with what? What hormone? What mineral? What, what do they work with? Well, we have the thyroid hormone, but it's nothing to do with what it secretes. The parathyroid works with calcium. So if you don't have enough calcium, you're gonna see things almost like a potassium deficiency, muscle weakness and twitching and paresthesia sort of things. If you see that, you know the calcium level will probably be low. So notify the healthcare provider and they can order a um, level, see where it's at and give replacements as needed. A child with Kussmaul respirations due to DKA, the increased respiratory rate is trying to compensate for what acid base alteration? Well, look at the question again. What acid base alteration does DKA have? And what does Kussmaul do? Well, Kussmaul is trying to go against this metabolic acidosis with respiratory alkalosis. But see, the question was asking it opposite. What was the acid base that you're starting with? So it's metabolic acidosis. You have very low pHs. And then your lungs say, let me slow down. Let me try to um, start some alkalosis to make that pH come back to normal. When talking with an adolescent regarding personal health concerns, which is most important? Again, of course, let them talk about what they wanna talk about. You may be the only person they can talk to. So listen, and don't act surprised with what you hear. You're gonna hear some incredible things. What procedure is priority to keep the lungs of a child with cystic fibrosis open? And it's that aggressive chest physical therapy. Very good. In the school age conflict of industry versus inferiority, what does industry mean? And that's about mastering that task, whether it's baking a cake, whether it is spelling the best, the, the best writer, uh, the best with math or throwing the ball the hardest. That's your task. The inferiority is what they can't do. And that's what they, they're inferior because they can't do it or so they think. Contraindication to administering the varicella vaccine to an adolescent. Well, varicella vaccine is a live vaccine. This is a different way of asking about it. What do you know about administering live vaccines? You cannot be immunosuppressed, whether it's from a disease or because you're taking corticosteroid medications. Very good. 
Early detection of a hearing impairment is critical. Which one is of primary importance? So when you can't hear, we worry about our speech development. And when we hear a child not speaking correctly, we are going to get them evaluated for their hearing. In helping a child to adapt to a hospitalization experience, the best approach is Always keep them on the same routine and schedule. And if you'd like, bring some toys in or jammies in or something that they would like that makes them feel better. But it's that routine, you know, bedtime the same time, bath time, lunch, dinner time, making sure the foods are what they'll eat too. When assessing vision on a child, the healthcare provider would use a Snellen chart at what distance? And what would happen if you're not seeing all the letters, you know, at 20 feet? So this is when you know that there's going to be an issue and probably report this to the, to the healthcare provider so that we can get glasses for the child. Referrals for cognitive impairment should occur when? And it's as early as possible. The earlier we go and we give intervention, they will recover from that most of the time. How would you help encourage a preschooler to be less apprehensive when taking their vital signs? And yes, let them touch and play with it. In fact, get your blood pressure taken for that really scared child. The nurse is discussing sexuality with the parents of an adolescent with cognitive impairment. What's important? You know, just because a child or adolescent is cognitively impaired doesn't mean one day that they might not live on their own. And we need to prepare them for that. And they need to know what a proper touch is. So they need a well-defined concrete code of sexual conduct. You, who should touch you where and when? They need to know that. So if it's not happening the right way, they can report it because many of these children are abused. What acid-base imbalance may you see with a child that's having profuse diarrhea? So remember when you have diarrhea, all of your um, enzymes that you use to digest food are more alkalotics. You're getting rid of them. So you become acidotic. Now, if you're vomiting, you're getting rid of acid. You become alkalotic. A multi-select. If an infant has not passed the meconium stool within the first day to day and a half, what would you assess for? Hirschsprungs, remember the outpatching with maybe a tiny little bit of ribbon stools you might see, cystic fibrosis and hypothyroidism. Very good. A child with sickle cell disease would most likely exhibit what sign? And this is usually why they end up going and seeking treatment. And that's pain. I mean, yes, they have dehydration, which is de uh, tachycardia too. They do have low hemoglobin hematocrits and usually have an infection. But what usually gets them into treatment is the pain. How do we alleviate the pain? Remember those sickle cell areas are clumped. So we need to dilate the vessels and make those blood uh, cells start to move around. And that's gonna help decrease the pain just by giving fluid back to the child. And of course, treating the infection. When teaching the child and family about celiac disease, 
which of these food items is allowed? And we can have rice, no wheat, barley, or rye. Oh, you're still on fire there. A six-year-old goes to the ER with abdominal pain, fever, and vomiting for the last 24 hours. What assessment is priority? The six-year-old complaining his tummy hurts. He's got fever, he's been vomiting for 24 hours. What assessment or what question do you ask next? And it is. Abdominal pain, where is it? Is it a surgical emergency? Is it an appendix? Is it something else? All the other questions are good, but the abdominal pain, that's the one for this question. A multi-select. Signs and symptoms of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So you're gonna feel that stenosis with the olive-sized mass, very good. Remember, pyloric stenosis is projectile. Reflux is just a dribble. And poor appetite, oh no, these kids are hungry because they keep vomiting their food up. They wanna keep eating. So they're always crying to eat more. A multi-select. A child with chronic kidney disease has renal osteodystrophy. What outcomes would you see with a child with chronic kidney disease? Renal osteodystrophy, what does that mean? So osteodystrophy has to do with vitamin D. Vitamin D has to do with bones. You don't get enough vitamin D, the bones won't grow well, they'll be painful, they'll be crooked. So all has to do with growth. You're gonna see a child who's not gonna grow as well as they should. Osteodystrophy, vitamin D. You suspect an infant has cryptoorchidism. How would you examine this infant? Yes, you're gonna have them in a warm room. I mean, if you have testicles in a cold room, they're gonna suck up real tight because they wanna keep warm. If they're in a warm room, they'll relax. So you'll get a better examination, a more accurate one. A multi-select. What teaching would you give parents on how a hypospadias is corrected? Now, the one thing we don't think of a hypospadias, what if you were a infant of a uh, family of Jewish faith? You know, they believe in taking the foreskin and removing it brisk. It's this big event that occurs. So we have to tell the parents this. We use the foreskin to cover the opening. We put in a stint to keep that inside open, you know, so that urine can flow. Now, if they're sent home with this then, and all we do is replace a gauze at the end. We don't flush it, we don't touch it. It's just there to keep urine flowing out of. We just change the diaper, that's all we do. But again, making sure that the uh, families of the Jewish faith realize the importance of keeping the foreskin. The hypospadias is when it's below and the underneath is on when top. It's above. Children with nephrotic syndrome are often given albumin and Lasix for fluid overload. What outcome do you want from the albumin and the Lasix? Remember, nephrotic syndrome has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with renal failure. It's just the kidneys saying, I don't know, this protein, get rid of it. And they don't save protein, protein is gone. So you have hypoalbuminemia and you have proteinuria. Now, when the blood, the, the vessels get decreased protein, it starts spewing fluid interstitially. That's why they get swollen up. So you give albumin, 
and you replace that protein because albumin is protein intravascularly, you give Lasix and it will push through and it should increase the urine output. It should reduce that edema. And when you do that, the blood pressure should also come down. Uh, it has nothing to do with a fever. And yes, you are right. Epispadius is on the top of the penis and a hypospadius is on the bottom. Both are the same treatment. We use the foreskin to replace either on top or bottom and both of them get the stint that is placed there. A two-year-old goes to the ER with inconsolable crying and a painful abdomen, which finding shows you this is a medical emergency. <clears throat> inconsolable crying because his tummy hurts. What could that be? And it's probably intussusception. And intussusception, the signs and symptoms, is a current jelly stool. You just get a little bit of this blob with maybe a little bit of mucus and blood in it. And that is the symptom that you would see. They need to reduce this intussusception or take the child to surgery. When assessing a two month old with vomiting, what questions should you ask the parent? It's something I always did. Get the infant in, see patient is vomiting, baby's vomiting. My first question to that parent every single time, <clears throat> is it reflux or is it pyloric stenosis? So how is it coming out? Is it dribbling or is it going across the room? Then after that, if it's just a dribbling, I'd go into the other questions here. You notice a child with congenital heart disease, the heart rate is decreasing. What other information is important to report to the healthcare provider? Congenital heart disease and this heart rate's going down. So this child's heart rate's going down and it's a child. So, you know, it's not an infant. A blood pressure of 68 over 44 is very low. Something is going on. Actually, you're an output. It could be 0.5 mLs to 2 mLs uh, per kilogram per hour. 20 mLs is not that bad. That was my first inclination when I was picking up this question. But it is the blood pressure. The blood pressure is going. This is showing you this child is going into failure. The heart needs support. Um, and this child now needs, it's more of an emergency, put the child on maybe some dopamine or something to increase the vital signs so that we perfuse the body. A multi-select. When entering the room of a child, the child becomes stiff and the arms and legs start shaking. Priority actions, what do you need to do? So we need to notify the response team in case we need some help. Um, monitor the time duration of seizure. When did it start? What did it look like? And if we can put them on the side, so they vomit, they were not gonna aspirate it. If we can protect those side rails, put the head of the bed down, all of those things are important. It's all about safety and protecting the airway if we can with these children. A three-year-old with a waddling gait and falling is admitting for testing. What examination should you expect? Let me go further. Three-year-old boy, waddling gait, gower sign, lordosis is admitting for testing. And we're suspecting right now Duchenne muscular dystrophy. When you see waddling gait falling, that means something's going on with the muscles. They're not working right. So three-year-old, it's right in that 
three to seven year old is where we start to see it. Remember with the electromyography or the EMG, it is painful. They put a um, electrical charge and it spasms the muscle and it does hurt. So please medicate your child so they don't hurt too bad. A mother calls the clinic about her child. She was playing in the woods and has a rash that is spreading. What over-the-counter medications good to use? <clears throat> so this rash is spreading. We don't know if it's getting to the point of anaphylaxis. Right, so we need to get treatment. You know, if it was just has a rash that's been the same for the last three hours, that's one thing. But this rash is spreading. You can't assume it's a simple rash and give over-the-counter antihistamine or corticosteroid cream. We need to get that child seen because you can't uh, assume this over the phone. Mother calls the clinic. A friend of her child has ticks from playing in the field. What do you tell the mom to do? So she's with her friend who now has ticks. This mother's concerned. What does she need to do? So all you're gonna do very simply, if you are thinking maybe ticks, you need to just look at the whole body and make sure you pull out the whole tick. And if you can't, that's when you call the physician because they do have some creams and whatnot they can use for this. But it's as simple as checking the body to see if you find them first. An adolescent goes to the school nurse complaining of ringing in her ears. What exam should you do first? So the first thing you're going to do is look, look inside. Is there any problem with the ears? Is there wax in there? Build up, you know, and then go from there. It could be due to the music, but it could be due to other things that are going on. So first, we're going to look inside that ear. And last question. A child's being discharged after 14 days of vancomycin. What teaching should be included? I mean, it could have been for osteomyelitis. It could be due to bacterial meningitis. They're on long-term, you know, these vancomycin type drugs. What do we know about the SINs and aminoglucosides? We worry about hearing and we worry about urine. We're gonna be monitoring their hearing. And we also will be monitoring to those wet diapers that actually is a part of it. Now, trough level, that's been overdue for a long time. And then says, well, if they have pain or fever, of course we'll give it, but we're worried about um, the side effects of this drug, this aminoglucoside, which is hearing and kidneys. Oh, here we go. We got done. Three, Jessica. Good job, Jessica. Number two, Larissa. Number one, Ari, you did it. Number four, Bella and Claudia. Okay, guys, make sure you do sign your attendance attestations. Um, you will be getting this review um, tomorrow. So anyone who needs any help, please just let me know. I'm here to help you. Any questions about it? I will be doing another review, another set of cahoots on Thursday night at 5.30. Thanks for holding on with me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. No, Thank you. Problem. No problem. Good night.